Hello friends, I'm Bill Miller and this is Questions and Answers with Pastor Bill. Well, I have a question today, another relevant calendar type question. It says, well, let me pray first and then I'll tell you what it says. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone watching this video. I pray that um, you would just anoint our days that we could represent you in the best way possible. Father, we continue to pray for revival, we here in central New York. We pray for the churches in central New York that they would go further and further into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As Father's Day approaches, I have been thinking about fathers in today's modern American culture. It seems like the role of fathers is being diminished. Are fathers still important? What should Christian fathers do today? Well, good question. My answer may seem too traditional or conservative or even old fashioned for some of you, but I believe fathers are vital to the church. We have a pivotal role in the society, in family, in the kingdom of God. Um, let's look at what the, the Bible says about fathers. In Proverbs 1 8, it says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. So there is a. Uh, a foundation in scripture that fathers are important and have something to pass on to their children. An, an English proverb says one father is more than a hundred schoolmasters. Um, fathers are the cornerstone of the family. I want to read from Ephesians 5 22 and 23. Wives submit to your husband as to the Lord. Okay I know half of you just completely turned off this video but listen the word of God is the word of God. Now, how it relates to us today can be interpreted, translated, uh, uh, taught differently. Uh, but the word is the word. In verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, I know that this verse has been used and misused uh, through the decades and centuries. I know that uh, some men have done terrible or stupid things to their wives uh, and use this verse as uh, justification. I believe that, that marriage is meant to be a loving relationship with love and respect on all sides. Um, I believe that marriage is between one man and one woman. I think we've talked about that before. Um, but there is a sense that the husband has a role to play in the marriage. Uh, that is an important one, one that we shouldn't shirk away from, uh, one that we don't uh, use to justify abuse, but we use it as part of the love relationship that God has prepared for a husband and wife. Uh, Mark Twain said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man learned in seven years. Matthew 21, 42 Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and is it not marvelous in our eyes? Well, this word that Jesus used for cornerstone is the same uh, word that's used in Ephesians 5, 23, where it says the husband is the head of the wife. The cornerstone sets the place and direction for all the other bricks. It is unique and yet in line with the other bricks. If the cornerstone is off, the whole building is off. If the bricks are not laid plumb with the cornerstone, then the whole building is off. Now, Jesus is our perfect cornerstone. We line up with him and we'll be square. We'll be okay. Um, but in the family, the husband, I think, is made to be a cornerstone within that familial family relationship. Um, years and years and years ago, someone prayed for our family a long time ago when James and Jordan, our two oldest kids, were very young. Uh, they thought that both of them would grow up to be ministers in the body of Christ, maybe ministers doing different functions, but somehow in ministry. When they said that, I realized how much responsibility I have to the body of Christ to live it loud, to pass it on, and to let it go. That literally I was raising children, but I wasn't just raising them for my own posterity, for so everybody would think I'm great, 
but I was raising them because they had an important part to play in the body of Christ. And everything I did with them was important. Uh, live it loud, meaning I should live my life the way Christ wants me to, so I can be an example to my kids. Pass it on. I should make an effort to pass on what God has given to me to my children. And then finally, to let it go. I mean, there's a time when we let our kids go and let them be who they are, uh, who they are in God. We don't try to mold them into our image. We don't try to, to steer their life in a direction that we wish our lives had gone or anything like that. Um, I got to admit, as a father uh, raising four children, uh, it was hit or miss. I think I had some good days. I had some bad days. Probably the same story uh, with most fathers all over the world. Um, could have done better. Probably could have done worse. Consider the father who was out walking. Okay, this is the last joke I'm going to tell today. Was out walking one day with his small son. When the youngster asked how the electricity went through the wires stretching across the telephone poles, his father replied, don't know, never knew much about electricity. A few blocks farther on, the boy asked what caused lightning and thunder. Well, to tell you the truth, said the father, I never exactly understood that myself. The boy continued to ask questions throughout the walk, none of which the father could explain. Finally, as they were nearing home, the boy said, Pop, I hope you don't mind me asking so many questions. Of course not, replied the father. How else are you going to learn? Yeah, that's how I feel sometimes in how I raise my kids. Thinking I did great, wanting to do great, accomplishing something a little less than great. But I do know that investing in your children is investing in generations to come. Now, I want to end today, or almost end today, with a, a story of David and Solomon and the temple of God. You know, David, uh, King David in Israel years ago was a great man, great king, uh, a man after God's own heart. And yet, he was not allowed to build the temple. God gave David the plans for the temple, told him how to do it. Uh, but then he said, you need to tell your son Solomon to build the temple. He's the one that's going to actually build it. Here's the story. I'm reading from 1 Chronicles 28. David summoned all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem. The officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions in the service of the king, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons, together with the palace officials, the mighty men, and all the brave warriors. King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of God for the footstool of our God, and I made plans to build it. But God said to me, you are not to build the house in my name, because you are a warrior and have shed blood. So, as we're about to see, David gave Solomon his truth and humility. Let's look at it. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the house of Judah he chose my family, and from my father's sons he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. Of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many, he has chosen my son, son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, Solomon your son is the one who will build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever, if he is unswerving in carrying out my commands and laws as is being done at this time. So now I charge you in the sight of all Israel and of all the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of God, be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as an inheritance to your descendants forever. So here are some keys that we can read from David's life in how he treated his son Solomon. At first, he told the truth. He said, God told me I can't build the, the temple. I wanted to build it, couldn't build it. Solomon's going to build it, build it. He also was humble. It took a humble man to say, God said, no, that's not easy. Um, we also see in this last passage that David publicly gave Solomon respect. Now, fathers, this is something we ought to do for our kids. We ought to show them respect. Too many fathers are insecure in their own lives, their own callings, and their own whatevers, and so they put their kids down. That's the opposite of what we're called to do. We need to lift our kids up. We need to show them respect, uh, help them to know that, that they are the person God's made them to be. Verse 9, 
And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the Lord, the God of your father, and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. If you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a temple as a sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. So David gave Solomon his respect for God. This is something David passed on to Solomon, uh, his respect for God. Verse 11, then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the portico of the temple, its buildings, its, cor its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, and the place of atonement. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts and the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms for the treasuries of the temple of God and the treasuries of the dedicated things. He gave him instructions for the divisions of the priests and Levites and for all the work of serving in the temple of God, as well as for all the articles to be used in its service. So here we see that David gave Solomon the words that God had given him. God literally told David, here's how I want you to build the temple, but you won't build it. Your son's going to build it. But he gave him all the plans. So David passes on the plans to Solomon just exactly the way God gave them to him. What does this mean for us? I think we should pass on to our children what God has taught us uh, in every detail. There are things that I think God has shown me that I just will not fulfill in my lifetime. I hope my kids do. Verse 14, he designated the weight of gold for all the gold articles to be used in various kinds of service and the weight of silver for all the silver articles to be used in various kinds of service. The weight of the gold for the gold lampstands and the lamps with the weight of each lampstand and its lamps and the weight of silver for each silver lampstand and its lamps according to the use of each lampstand. The weight of gold for each table for consecrated bread, the weight of silver for the silver tables, the weight of pure gold for the forks, sprinkling bowls, and pitchers, the weight of gold for each gold dish, the weight of silver for each silver dish, and the weight of the refined gold for the altar of incense. He also gave him the plan for the chariot, that is the cherubim of gold, and spread their wings and shelter the ark of the covenant of God. All this, David said, I have in writing from the hand of the Lord upon me, and he gave me understanding in all the details of the plans. So David tried to pass on to Solomon his respect for God, his love for God, the plans for the temple. And then he gives him the material things necessary to do his job, the things that God had given to him. I think that says to us as fathers that we ought to pass on to our children what we can give them as far as material plans. They have a calling. My kids will have a calling and a ministry after I'm gone. And I want to make sure they have everything they need to do that. Now, as a pastor, you know, I'm not rolling in dough, so it's not like I've left them millions of dollars. But I hope that when I go and uh, whatever I had accumulated here on earth is given to Jamie, and then eventually Jamie goes, I just pray that the things that we have that are passed on to our children are useful in the ministries that God has called them to. All right, verse 20. David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. So David gave Solomon the hope that God had given to him. And that's important. We can give our kids stuff. We can try to teach them things we've learned. But we also want to give them the hope that God has given us. Help them to know that we believe in them, that we trust in them, that we think they have a future and a hope in God. In 1 Thessalonians 2, and I'll end here, verses 11 and 12, For you know that we dealt with each, each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. The reason I wanted to end here is this is Paul writing to a church and he's talking about how he treated the, the church members and maybe the church leaders. And he says, you know how we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his children. So that just got my ears perked up to think, OK, he's talking about something that children ought to or fathers ought to do when they're dealing with their children. And he says, encouraging, comforting 
and urging you to live lives worthy of God. Um, this may be the most important thing that we pass on to our children. Encouragement, comfort, and urging them to live lives worthy of God. And that doesn't mean living your life or living a life that you've planned out for them. Although, you know, we'll push in that direction and see what happens. But we want to urge them to live lives worthy of God. In other words, discover your calling in God, your ministry, your giftings, and walk in it. Encourage and comfort them in that. So thank you for listening. Uh, it is nearly Father's Day. We are celebrating Father's Day at Redeemer Church this Sunday at 1030 on uh, Morgan Road in Liverpool, New York, a suburb of Syracuse. We have special speakers coming in, uh, missionaries, and they will be sharing a little bit about their ministry while also touching on um, what Father's Day means to them. I'm excited to say that we have invested in some super cool gifts for fathers, both fun and funny and tasty. Don't want to give it all away, but there you go. If you're looking for a church to go to on Sunday, I would encourage you and invite you to come to Redeemer. If you have any other questions, check out our website, www.myredeemer.com. If you have a question for questions and answers with Pastor Bill, send it to pastorbill at myredeemer.com. God bless you guys. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person here. I thank you that COVID is really on the way out and that uh, our society is once again opening up and people are able to earn a living and able to go out and have fun together and see friends. I thank you for all the vaccines. I pray that you would continue to keep not only our country safe, but our world safe. Help other nations who are not as rich as we are and not as able to get vaccines to somehow get them. I pray that our world would get over this uh, terrible virus, not just our country. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.